Good morning. How's everyone today? Great. Great. Well, welcome to Kingsway Church. And uh, for anybody that is a first time visitor, welcome. We hope that you just feel right at home. Our goal is for you to just feel like when you walked in the door that you have you have entered into your living room. You're right at home. You have people, friends, and and uh, folks around you that will love you and care for you. So welcome, and we're thankful that you chose to be here this morning. Also, I'll quickly tell you, as you can obviously tell, we've done a few uh, arranging, a few things different, and we have some things going on. Don't get freaked out. Oh, I know change is so hard sometimes for people, especially when you're old like me. The older that you get, the, the more difficult change uh, comes, and uh, but we're we're changing some things up, and it's going to be great. Give us a few weeks; we'll get it done. It'll be cool, and uh, you'll have uh, you know you'll see what what's going on, and it'll it'll be just fine. Also, we're not uh, we're very close to getting started over here on our um, kitchen uh, that's going to connect to the inside out building. That's going to be amazing. We're going to have different opportunities to be able to do different things that we wasn't able to do before, and so. We are moving. We've got progress being uh, made and things that are happening. So we just, uh, uh, we're doing, and we do all that for you, right? It ain't, the, trust me, a kitchen ain't for me. It is kind of for Linda, but, you know, uh, but uh, it is for really for the, for the people at Kingsway Church so that we can serve you better and uh, help you to uh, uh, be able to enjoy all the things that we have going on around here. Hey, so uh, we're starting a new series today. Hey, and it's good to be back. It's been a few weeks since I've had the opportunity to minister, so it's good to be back, but we're starting a new series that I have entitled The Book. How many of you kind of figured that one out pretty quick? Kind of knew where we'd be going with that. And by the way, Jim Evans, that was an awesome, another awesome bumper video. You're amazing. I tell you that, uh, you know, can't say it enough, but you do a tremendous job, and it's beautiful. But we're doing a series I don't know how long I'll be because I have a lot to say. And I think the book has a lot to say as well. There's a lot of things. It's inexhaustible. I could, I could go with this series for you know years and years and still not exhaust everything that, that it has to say. But we're going we're gonna to talk about some things that I believe is going to encourage you. And I think it's going to inspire you. And so we're going to get into that. Now, first, let me just say this. There are, there's a lot of books in the world, right? And I don't know if you're like me, but I can throw away a video. I can throw away a CD. It is very hard to throw away a book. For some reason, for me, it's difficult to throw a book away. But I can throw a video away and throw a CD away, but I just struggle with throwing books away. There's a lot of books in the world. I'm going to just share a few of them with you right here just, just to, to make my point. There are self-help books. There's motivational books. There's how to get rich books. There's uh, political books. There's love story books. There's science fiction books. Um, there are uh, science books, geography books. There's Christian books. There's all kinds of different books. And as I started going through this, I started thinking about some of my favorite and some of Debbie's favorite books. And so I thought, well, let's talk about this just a minute. There's a great book by John Maxwell. I always enjoy the inspirational books, you know, something that will inspire me and encourage me and, and get me excited and tell me I can do it. And John Maxwell has a book called The Winning Attitude. The Winning Attitude. How many of you believe that your attitude matters in life? Amen. Well, I like that. And so... I like that book. There's a guy that he's gone home to be with the Lord, but he wrote a book called The Good Life, T.L. Osborne. And uh, T.L. Osborne wrote this, this book called The Good Life, and it's a great book. I've read that book, and uh, that's amazing. And you can get good nuggets and truth out of that, and, and, and that there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, I just recently uh, read these two books by Robert Morris called The Blessed Life. What a great book. What a great book. He wrote another book called The Power of Your Words. What a great book. Great book. Now, those are some Christian content, but then there's also some other things here as well. 
that are all relevant in our lives because there's, there's different books. There's one uh, by, by Brother Kenneth Hagin called The Triumphant Book. These are mine. You can't have any of these, so don't ask, um, even though I've read them, uh, most of them. The Triumphant Church, a great book. This is a great book right there. Here, honey, I'll just give you that, and that way you can put them back in there. Then, now, Debbie, she, per, she likes um, John Grisham. Y'all ever read John Grisham? Sometimes she just wants to get lost in her, you know, in, in, in kind of, you know, something that isn't necessarily super spiritual or anything like that. And she has a book, uh, she's got all the John Grisham books. I mean, there, I just, there were so many to choose from. But she said, this is a great book called The Innocent Man. And he tends to write about juries and, and uh, attorney type things. And so um, lots of great stories that he's written throughout the years. Great book. Uh, there's a, my, one of my personal favorite books as far as financially driven is a book by none other than Donald Trump called The Art of the Deal. Read this book a number of years, years ago, a fantastic book if you're in business and to help you get some kind of business thinking concepts of, of how to do business and how to do deals and negotiations, great books. Um, there's a book called uh, Josephus. Y'all ever heard of Josephus? It's a history book. It's, it's about history, and, and Josephus is an amazing, I haven't read the whole thing, I've read bits and pieces of it, but it's an, yeah, it's a big book, but it's an amazing book. Talks about the history of, of, of really the Bible and other uh, periods that, that he covers within that. Then there was another book that I pulled out that was uh, a great story, an inspirational story about Kurt Warner. Y'all ever heard of Kurt Warner? Yes. Yeah. Used to play, uh, he, he, was, he played college football and di- hadn't made the pros and he was working in a, uh, a, a supermarket grocery store as a bag boy stocking groceries and gets a call from the uh, St. Louis, at the time, St. Louis Rams. And so he, he gets signed. The starting quarterback, Trent Green, goes down with a season-ending energy, en- ener- injury, <laughs> sorry, and Kurt Warner gets thrust into the limelight and Kurt Warner leads the St. Louis Rams to a Super Bowl. Amazing. An amazing story. So a lot of great books in the world. But you know what the best-selling book is year after year? The Bible. But now I want to ask you some things. I want to ask you this before. Yes, it is the Bible. But I want to ask you. I want to ask you some things. Why do you ascribe so much confidence to the Bible? It's the Word of God. How do you know that? Now, I know your mother told you the Bible is the Word of God. I know that. But if that's what you're hanging on to, as to that's the reason that you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, I'm going to tell you something that might, might sound a little harsh, but it ain't enough. It won't be enough. It just will not be enough to get you from point A to point B. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, someone in your family, your grandmother, your grandfather telling you, Honey, this is the Word of God. Don't you ever doubt it. This is the Word of God. Now, he or she might have the revelation that it is the Word of God, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's your revelation. You have to get a revelation of why you believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, that it is the authorized Word of God for humanity. You have to get a revelation of that. And I'm going to talk about that and give you some depth and detail of that over the next few weeks that I believe is going to secure your belief and give you the confidence that when you have conversation with other people that you'll be able to undoubtedly, not just because someone told you that it was the Word of God, but confidently Know in your heart that this is the Word of God. And I believe that as we talk about this, it's going to reveal some things to you. Because you have a lot of choices. Why, do you, why did you not choose the Book of Mormons? Why are you not a Mormon? Well, probably because your mother or father, your grandparents, told you that this is what you do. And this is who you are. It's almost like politically, like when, for many people, 
They become one of either party, not necessarily because that's what they believe, but because that's what their family was, and so they automatically come engrafted into that, and that's what they become. Well, folks, you have to make decisions for yourself, and you have to make a decision. Is the Bible what you follow? Is the Book of Mormons what you follow? Is the Quran what you choose to follow? Why, do you, why did you not pick the Quran? Why did you not become a Muslim? It's because somebody, I'm telling you, somebody told you that this is the right thing. Christianity is the right thing. It's the right book. It's the right thing to apply to your life. Somebody's told you that along the way. But the question that I want to get seared inside of your spirit is, is it your revelation? Are you just doing things because you, that's what you've been told? You've, you've, you've been, it's been ingrained in you. You go to church on Sunday. You go pre, listen to the preacher. You spend an hour and a half. And after that, that's it. It's done. I come back next Sunday and do the same thing all over again. But when the chips are down and when you really have to depend on what is right, what will work and what won't work, it has to be your revelation. It cannot be just because that your mother told you. And in fact about it, you know, if you say, well, no, 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 no. I can tell you right now, the Word of God is the Bible. I know that. My parents told me that. My grandparents told me that. And I, I, they would not tell me wrong. Well, let me ask you this. What about somebody that is raised in Mormonism? Did you think their parents told them that, that Mormonism was the right thing? Sure. So why don't they feel just like you? And how does that make them wrong? And how does it make you right? Now, we are right without any doubt. So don't, don't get, I'm not trying to, I'm not promoting Mormonism, I, but I'm trying to critically make you think so that you get to the revelation that this is the Word of God. But how do they get away from that? How do you ever witness to somebody that Mormonism is incorrect and that the Bible, our, this Bible, is the authorized Word of God? How do you ever talk to somebody that is uh, a Muslim and believe that the Quran is the authorized Word of God? How do you ever witness to them? Because after all, they have the same general upbringing that you've got, just but with something presented to them differently. And after all, if you believe it because your mother and your father, your grandparents told you that it's right, how do you not know that they'll do, just do the same thing? They, they will, right? So how do we get people to see that our way is the better way? It's the right way. It is the Word of God. How do we do that? So let's embark on a journey and let's talk about some things as we kind of begin this series. If you don't mind, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm going to start reading with verse 1. Now I could start all kinds of places. There's so many places that I could get, but this seemed appropriate for me to begin this discussion. He says in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now notice that what the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, he's saying something, someone was with God during the process of everything that was being made. Right? Okay, let's go on. He says, in Him... Was life in him, who's he talking about? The Word. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Now watch this. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was, was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh nor of the will of man but God 
And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he beheld his glory, the glory, as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. Who was he talking about in this passage? Now I want you to notice he says that there is light. Jesus is light. He references the Word. The Word was with God through the beginning of creation. And the Word brought light to the world. And that means that the world, obviously, if there was a need for light, that means that there was darkness in the world. How many of you realize darkness is still in the world? But light, watch now, light, Jim, let me just do this real quick. Light, light exposes darkness. But what does, happens when it's, when it's dark? Go ahead. This is what the world looked like. This is what was around. Now, in the darkness, I can't, it would be difficult for me to find what I'm looking for. I don't mean to scare you all, so Jim, better turn the light back on. People get freaked out on me. Thank you, sir. We were praying that that light would come back on, that somehow or another it didn't have a weird, uh, like, you know what I'm saying? We, well, we'd just turn the big lights on if we had to. But that's what it was like. It was dark. The world was dark and it needed light. light. When light comes on, it exposes darkness and it reveals paths. It reveals the ability to be able to move and see and do and, and function that otherwise you would not be able to do. And that's what, in essence, what he's telling us is that God, through Jesus coming into the world, brought light. And so... Jesus is, is called in John 1, the Word of God. So when we're analyzing words, what do they promote? What is it promoting? Now, when you think of Jesus, what do you think of? What does Jesus promote? If you had to, to, to say just one or two words, what would you say is a representation of Jesus? For, I mean, everybody's got some different, th different things, what that might look like and sound like. But for me, these are the first two words that come to my mind when I think of Jesus. Jesus promotes love, and he promotes opportunity. Because at this point, before Jesus has, has done what needed to be done, man needed an opportunity. Because man was on a path to stay and remain in darkness, right? Right? So Jesus, by his love, presents opportunity to people. And it's really because of his love that opportunity even exists. Otherwise, you don't get opportunity if there's no love. Why did Jesus, why was he willing to do what he did so that man could be redeemed? Because of love. He was willing to, God so what? Love the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus willingly did it. So if love is the motivation to the end result, the end result was opportunity. Uh, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That sounds like an opportunity to me. Doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but it's an opportunity. So Jesus promotes love. He promotes opportunity through love and by love. And then I looked at John, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, and I'm going to come back to these a little bit more. I don't have a lot of time to spend a, a, on this because I, a, of where I want to get to this morning. But I'm going to come back to this, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in, in some, uh, the next few weeks. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, he says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on the earth, now, I want you to keep that word bear witness in your, in your mind. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Notice he uses the word bear witness. Bear witness. What does that mean? It's um, a feeling, an unction, a, a, a certain just, you know, I, I, it just seems, seems like the right thing. So the bearing of the witnesses on the inside of you points you to somewhere. And he says that in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit bear witness. And on the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, 
these all three agree as one. Then he says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, and again, I'll spend a little bit more time on this a little bit later. He says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. The spirit of man. You all understand you're not like, this is not really you, right? Amen. I mean, it is. Well, let me rephrase it. <laughs> it, it, it is you, but it's not the eternal you. You, you, you are a spirit. Brother Hagin used to say it like this. You are a spirit. You live in a body and you have a soul. Or a, um, your mind, will, and intellect. But the real you, the makeup of what makes you who you are, is the spirit that lives on the inside of you. It's kind of the best example that I could say is you have a glove on your hand. And as long as the hand is in the glove... The glove moves, right? It moves around and functions, and it can go up, down, all around. It can, it can pick stuff up. It can drop stuff. But when you take the hand out of the glove, the glove becomes lifeless and ineffective. That's the way the spirit of man is. So the spirit of man is what hears and knows and, and understands and, and, and digests. The spirit of man, and that's, he says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. It's how the Lord communicates to us. And also, let me just say this really quick. I heard Keith Moore, this is a little farther in my notes, but it'll be worth saying right now. I heard Keith Moore say this just a few weeks ago. I love Keith Moore. He's my favorite uh, minister and, and throughout the years and has been for a number of years. I've listened and watched and I don't know, heard countless messages by Brother Keith. But Keith said this. He, when, when we're talking about, um, you know, how that uh, these, these kind of things, the, the, talking about the spirit of the man, the spirit of, of uh, or the, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And we're seeing that all these things uh, begin to work, how they work together and how that, um, you know, things function and, and normally work together. Let me try to see if I can find the exact quote. I want to, I want to read it the way that, uh, that he had said it. And I wrote it down here that I think will be uh, a blessing to you. If I can find it. <laughs> come on, help me, Lord. I may just have to come back to it when I get to it here in just a minute because... I can't find it right now, so I'll come back to that in just a minute. Anyway, I'll come back. I'll find that because it'll be relevant. In when we think about the purpose of Jesus, what he's doing, and in, in trying to, to compel us to get to a place to believe him, what, what does he use? Now, I want to remind you of a story in Luke chapter 19. There was a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is a tax collector. All the tax collectors were thieves. Thieves. Right? They stole. They took more than they should. And so Zacchaeus, is, but he's a fairly wealthy man. And he sees Jesus coming and he climbs up into a tree and he wants to see all the commotion and the parade and of the people that are coming. And so he's looking and he sees Jesus and Jesus walks by. And he looks at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, get down. I'm paraphrasing. Zacchaeus, get down from there. We're going to your house for dinner. Now, Jesus got under a major amount of condemnation for this because people said, oh, you, you say you're a holy man and you're actually going to go have dinner, eat in, in a thief in his house, a tax collector? And essentially, Jesus says, I didn't come to save the ones that already think they're saved. See, the Pharisees thought they were already saved. He said, but I've come to seek and save that which is lost. And he actually uses the phrase, you know, when, when, he, when he says that he's going to Zacchaeus' house because Zacchaeus says, Lord, if I've wronged any man, I'll restore him four times over and I give half of my goods to the poor. Jesus makes a resounding statement when he says, 
today salvation has come to your house. Now, was it because he gave up his goods? Just because he gave up half? In other words, that was the magic number like, man, you've got a million dollars and you're giving a half a million of it away? That's the magic number. Was that it? No, he says salvation's come to your house because there's a heart change. Something has happened inside of his heart that he recognized he's wronged people and now he wants to make it right. And he's like, now I, I, want, I want to be a blessing. I want to, to, to do what you do. I want to follow after your footsteps. And he tells him that uh, salvation's come to your house. But I want you to notice this. The Bible says in this phrase, the man, son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. This is different than the Quran. It's different than Jehovah Witnesses. It's different than Mormonism. Almost every other religion that I know of at least has some kind of condition set upon it where you have to do something. The only condition for salvation in Christianity is to believe. There's no action per se that's required of us to go out and do this or do that. It is to believe. When he said that I have come to seek and save that which is lost, it says this to me. Jesus is saying, I took the first step and I am walking in love towards you. You know, many religions are trying to weed people out. The difference with Christianity is Jesus is trying to get more in. What does he, what does he tell us in, uh, in 2 Peter 3, 9? That he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? He wants everybody in the kingdom. He says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So in other words, he's, telling, he's trying to tell you, do this. Where other religions are saying, uh, do this or else you, you're going to burn, you're going to die. And in fact, about it, many of them say there's nothing you can do. It's, you're, you're just basically taking up space on the planet. It is different in the kingdom of God. When we look at what we have come to know as the Bible. He says also in Psalms 119, 130, the entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. Everybody tries to make things so complicated in the world. You've got all these, like I said, other religions try to, you know, you've got so many rules to adhere to, so many things you have to, to measure up to. And the reality of is the, really what God wants to, what he really wants is he just wants you to know you're loved and accept that. And when you do, then he says, I have something for you. It's like this. Other religions are saying humanity has no connection to God. You are just a byproduct of a creation. But there's no connection to the Creator. Whereas we see that that is not the case with the Lord. He, it, it, we see on the day of creation that He tells us that we were created how? In His image after His likeness. So in other words, He's, he's telling us we are made very similar to Him. In His image, after His likeness, and so we are a bit of Him. We are a part of Him. His breath is in our body. And so that makes us connected to Him, and He wants us to know that we're connected to Him, rather than just to think that you're just a byproduct of the creation that's different from the rest of creation. There are different things that God created that are beautiful and amazing. But they're not connected to Him in the same way that we're connected to Him. According to our Bible. And He says, The entrance of your words, they give light and it gives understanding to the simple. You don't have to be the smartest guy on the planet in order to be saved. You don't, as we used to say, sometimes you, you don't have to be the sharpest knife. You know, 
you, you can you can just be simple and say, wait just a minute, I simply believe what he says. It's different than this in other, in other beliefs. God wants us to see that this is how we're related to him, and he wants us to know that this is the way that he sees us. In 2 Timothy, because he's, he, like I said, he's trying to, he's trying to, other places, other religions are trying to weed th- people out. He's trying to bring them in. Also, I, let me just say it like this too, that the Bible, to me, feels like sometimes like a puzzle, Bob. It, 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 and I'm not great at puzzles, to be honest, but it does feel like a puzzle because one piece connects to another piece. And then another piece connects to that. And as you go along in life, the, the, and I'm talking about your, mature, your, your spiritually mature life. I don't necessarily mean just because of your age. The more maturity that you get in the things of God, the puzzle begins to get clearer and clearer. You begin to see more of what was intended. Do you know it's kind of like when you first get saved? You don't get to see usually the big picture. I mean, I think if the Lord did show us the big picture sometimes at the beginning, we might, not, we, we might have a problem because we wouldn't understand. We wouldn't be able to accept it all because it looks too grand, looks too big. I know that when I, when I got saved, it was, it was all I thought at the moment was, I, I, don't, I, like, I just want to go to heaven. There was two thoughts to my, to my mind processing. I want to go to heaven and I want my children to be raised godly. Those were the two thoughts that went through my mind. I, I, didn't, I had no aspirations whatsoever to go any farther than that. It, it, it was, at that moment, that was all I could see. And that was one piece of the puzzle, and then you put another piece in it and another piece, and then the thing gets bigger and clearer. You begin to see more, and you begin to understand more. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. Now, I love the entire Bible. I love the Old Testament. I love the stories of the Old Testament. They're amazing. They're wonderful. And, and they're purposeful. But, they're, they're, they're given to us with an intent to connect us to the New Testament. Yes. They're, 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 uh, let, me, let me just say it like this. Gosh, I have to be careful and make sure not make big broad, too big broad statements because sometimes they can be, get taken out of context. But let me say it like this. If all you had was the Old Testament and you didn't know anything about the New Testament or the New Testament didn't exist, the Old Testament would do you very little, very, just a small amount of good. It might give you some principles in life. It might give you some things, good things to learn. But it would not change your eternity. But see, but yet in the Old Testament, connected to the New Testament, it brings light. I, I was thinking about Genesis chapter 22 when God told Abraham to take your son Isaac, your only son who you love, take him and offer him. Well, now that was an amazing thing to ask because Abraham's been waiting on Isaac for a long time. And finally, finally, he shows up. And then just a few years later, he's a young teen. And most, most uh, scholars believe that he was like a, 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 like a teenager at this point. And God tells Abraham to take your son and sacrifice him as a burnt offering to me. Now, we know that story and it's filled full of faith uh, 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 you know, from, from uh, Abraham's uh, perspective, because he knows that if he actually kills him, since he's the promised son of which his seed, he would be the father of many nations that had to come through Isaac, that God would have to raise him from the dead. I mean, so obviously Abraham was full of faith. But watch, he says, the correlation, he says, now I know that you won't withhold anything from me. And then we take it and fast forward to the New Testament, and we see that God took his most valuable uh, uh, relationship, which was with the Word of God, the Son of God, and was willing to say, I'm not willing to withhold anything from you. There's a correlation and a connection. And you begin to see that the Old Testament was a foreshadowing 
and it was a prelude to what was yet to come. And then you, ca- you connect the two together and it becomes amazing revelation Amen. to show that God from the beginning of time has had me and you in mind about bringing us to a place of not just a creation, but a relationship. To actually get you to the place to where there's relationship with the Creator, not just a creation. And that's, a, that's different than any other religion. But how does that still make you believe that the Bible is the Bible? See, I believe this. I believe that the Bible is a collection of God's thoughts transformed to paper and therefore presenting God's thoughts and plans to man. The Bible is God's thoughts transformed to paper, presenting to me and you His thoughts and plans for each and every one of us. Here's the other thing that I wanted to tell you that Brother Keith had said. He said, when God speaks to you, how many of you could say that you believe there has been times in the past that God was speaking to you? That you heard the voice of God, and I don't mean audibly necessarily. It could be, but not, not, I don't mean necessarily audibly. But you heard something booming on the inside of you. I know I've heard the voice of God in that sense, not audibly, but in that sense where it was so big to me. I, don't, I mean, numbers of times... One time the Lord told me that my, my oldest daughter would be healed of something and he gave me specifics, like super specific stuff that I came home and, and told my wife. I said, I, if I've ever heard from God, I heard from God today. Here's what he said. And as God is my witness and Debbie is my witness, if it didn't happen exactly like what I told her, I mean, it was amazing. It was the voice of God. But watch, this is what Brother Keith said. He said, God, when he speaks to man, isn't speaking just to communicate. Solely. Now that might feel like that, like he has something to say and I'm supposed to listen, which is true. That, that, there is truth in that, but that's not solely his reason for, communic- for speaking to us, meaning communication. It is that, but it's also something else. What happens when God speaks? When God speaks... Let there be what? What happened? When God said, uh, earth be, what happened? Creation began. When God speaks, He is constantly creating. You just don't, you only know the, the, I say the half, you don't know the tenth. The one-tenth of a tenth of it. We don't know the magnitude of what God has truly created. You don't really know. You see what you see, but you're greatly limited. When God speaks, it is creation coming out of His mouth. When He's speaking to you and He says, Be strong and of a good courage. It's not just a pep talk. Even though it is that too. It's not just a pep talk. It is God speaking creation inside of you. As you are hearing it, it's creating something on the inside of you to say, I am strong. What did he call Gideon? Now, Gideon, by every example that we can tell, Gideon was what? In the beginning, he, he's a bit of a wimp. Yes. And he is not what he even would have considered a mighty man of courage. But what did God say when he told him, when he spoke to him and he said, Thou mighty man of valor. What do you think was taking place? Was he communicating with Gideon? Yes. But was he also creating in Gideon something else? Yes. Yes, because what happens when God speaks and you listen? Watch now, watch. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when God speaks, He communicates, but also when He speaks, creation begins to happen because faith begins to build. He's creating something in you. He's creating faith inside you to be able to stand when you need to. And here's the other thing. 
There's an old saying that Kenneth Hagin used to say that I, I know is absolutely the truth. He says, faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith begins where the will of God is known. If I come in and I just say something crazy out of, you know, con something that don't, don't have any context in the Bible, could I expect that your faith could grow based on what I said? Or if I told you something that you knew was contrary to the Word of God, would you expect faith to grow for that? But if you know that it is the will of God, what is the will of God? Here is the only thing that I can hang my hat on when it comes to assessing what is the will of God. Is the Word of God. I have to use the Word of God to assess what the will of God is. That's why that I'm totally, utterly confident that it is the will of God for people to be healed. And that doesn't mean everybody's getting healed the way we'd like for it to be. But I'm talking about the heart of God. Is, it God, is the heart of God for everybody to be healed? Because some people will say, you never know, brother, sometimes it is and sometimes it ain't. You just never know with God. Well, if I take that as truth, how can I ever put any faith to that? Because I'm constantly thinking, I might be one of those that you just never know. Sometimes it does and sometimes it don't. Truth is, sometimes it does and sometimes it don't. But that doesn't mean that that's what God said. Doesn't mean that's what God's will is. I have to, I cannot base what I believe based upon your experience. Don't shout me down. I, just because you experience something different, now brother, I can tell you by experience, that just don't work. I'm sorry, I can't use your experience to build my faith. Good or bad. Because it's misplaced. My, my resource for faith is misplaced if it's in your experience, good or bad. It's not, I can't get faith from you. Where is my resource for faith to come from? It has to be based on this. Does that make any sense? Remember, the Bible is a collection of God's thoughts transformed to paper and therefore presenting God's thoughts and plans Two and four man. God's plan for man. Do you all remember, how many of you ever watched The Twilight Zone? I love The Twilight Zone. The, and, I, and I like them all, but especially the black and whites. Oh, they're, they're, they're awesome. I love those shows. They, and they know, you know they normally come on like at uh, New Year's Eve, things like that. I'd sit sometimes and walk, watch for several hours different episodes. It's just super cool. There is one particular episode that if you're a Twilight Zone fan, you might recall. It's called, it, and, the, and the, the title of it was To Serve Man. Y'all remember that one? So it's about these aliens that come down, and they don't know whether or not they're, they're like going to, to you know, be peaceful or war or whatever. And so they come in, they go, no, we come at peace, we come at peace. And, and then they have this big book, this giant book, and it's, and it's called To Serve Man. You remember that? And so there's these very, uh, the scientists and the, all these people that know everything. I mean, they're the, the scholars. And so they're reading the book, trying to figure it out. And so they're offering trips back to their planet. And so people are feeling comfortable with the aliens. And so finally, the two men that are deciding, you know, reading the book, is this a good thing? Are they truly here for peace? And, and the one guy comes to the conclusion, they're here for peace. And so he goes, so he signs up on one of the trips. And he's climbing onto the ship. And it's right at the very end of the episode. And the other guy comes running. He goes, Professor, Professor, no, no, don't get on. And he's like, what, what? And then there's, as they're shutting the door on him, he goes, it's a cookbook. <laughs> How to serve man. Get it? 
There was deception. Watch now. There was deception in the book. There is no deception in the book. There is no deception in this book. Everything that God says in here is true. Everything that you read that ever happened, some of the things that, some of the stories that Jim had in the, in the bumper video, some of those famous stories, that really happened. It, it really happened and people recorded it down so that me and you could see it for all eternity. And that as we see it, what happens? Our faith begins to grow and we begin to believe and the more that we believe, the greater our faith gets and we begin to connect with what His Word is. But we have to get to a place, and I'm going to talk more about this in the, in the oncoming weeks, about how you can know, how you can know that you know that you know that the Bible is the Word of God. How you know that when you were debating, because again, you can't count on somebody else's revelation. Just like your experience cannot convince me that, you know, this is what I, how I should believe. You cannot be the resource for my faith. You just can't. Because I don't know what, you, what all you do. I don't know what, how, what angle you came at it from. I have to look at the Word of God and go, this is my only resource for building my faith. And in the same way that I have to use this to build my faith, I also have to use this as the resource to decide, is this book the right book? Or is there, another, is there another religion? Is there another thing that somebody's doing that makes more sense than this? And I'm going to talk more about that in the next little bit. Let me get ready to close with just a couple of things. He says here about things that are written. We know the famous account in Luke chapter 4 where you know Jesus is being tempted of the devil and he, he continually uses, it is written, it is written. Because Jesus is saying, this is what you have to believe. This is the thing that you have to believe. Look, look at this. 1 Peter 1, 16 says, Because it is written, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So that tells me God wants us to be holy people. That doesn't mean mistake free. It doesn't mean perfection. And it doesn't mean that, you know, somehow or another, you're kind of like almost just a sliver shy of Jesus. I know I can't be that. But it does tell us that we should strive to be more like Jesus. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. You might say, well, why is that important? Why, why is that a good thing? Why would you preach that? There's none righteous. You tell me. Because he's talking about people that were thinking they were righteous in their own thinking. There's none righteous within their own actions, is what he's saying. Because he goes on to say and tell us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he says you're not righteous there, but then in 2 Corinthians 5 he says, but we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're not righteous in our own selves, but we are righteous when we are identified in Christ. So when you identify as a Christian, he's telling you that you are right in the sight of God. He didn't say you were perfect. He didn't say that somehow magically when you got born again or got saved, you, you gave your life to the Lord, that you became, you know, this infallible being. You aren't and you won't. However, your identity is no longer wrapped up in yourself, but it's wrapped up in Him. And therefore, because of that, you are now identified as the righteousness of God in Christ. He said in 1 Corinthians 1.19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Do you ever meet people where they know everything? They know everything. They've got it all figured out. And if you said, you make one response, they've got the answer. Oh, well, it's because of this. It's because of that. There are very smart people that know this. The planet is really this many years old. I'm like, I, I'm not saying I don't believe in some measure of science. I, I know that 
you know, I, I'm not denying that, but I'm like also like, but dude, can you not understand? You are in the grand scheme of things, you are so small compared to how large the God is, and you don't know everything. Well, we can see that there's this many planets and this many stars in the universe, and we talked about that a few several months ago about how many stars that are known stars. That I think they were known stars. 10,000 stars for every grain of sand that is on the planet. That's a lot. It's incalculable. But I'll submit to you, it's even more than that. Because you can't see it. You only see what you can see. You can't see beyond what you can see. And there's more than what you beyond what you can see because he's that big and so when you think you've got everything all figured out I, I, this is what I, one thing I, tr- I really love about Christianity it's like it makes you realize in the grand scheme of things I don't mean in in value okay so don't misunderstand when I say this but it makes me see how small I really am and how large he really is now I don't mean in value in value you are a prized possession to the Lord. But I'm talking about in me, my individual being, it doesn't matter if I'm a small man or a large man in stature, or I'm a small man with a bank account or a large man with a bank account, or if I have no power compared to ultimate power on the earth. It doesn't matter. You are so small in the grand scheme of things compared to Him because He is amazing. And yet, he's still motivated by one key thing. And that is love. He's motivated by his love for you. And I don't see that in any other religion. I don't see anybody else talking about the love of God to humanity. I don't see that. I see rules and regulations and hoops and and uh, certain things that I have to jump through and, and hope to aspire and hope that I'm one that actually gets to make it in. But I don't see that with God. What I see is maximum love, and I see Him saying, my will is not for anybody to perish, not a single person on the planet, but that all would come to what? Repentance. That everybody, he wants, like everybody in your worst enemy, the people you hate, that, that, well, hopefully you don't hate anybody. I hope you don't hate anybody because you ain't supposed to hate anybody. But somebody that you don't have two, you don't give two flips about. Do you know that God still loves that person? He still wants them saved. He still wants them to come to a place of repentance. It doesn't matter who it is. God's in love with everybody. It doesn't mean he loves everybody's ways. But he's in love with everybody. And that to me is one of the things, and I'm going to talk about more of those, one of the things that tells me that Christianity Christianity differentiates from everybody else because it is the expression of God's love for every single person on the planet. Not just me, but me included. I mean, I look at Debbie sometimes, she'll look at me and she'll say, I love you, I love you so much, you know, or something like that. And I'm like... Well, yeah, you you live with me. Of course you love me. Right. But then there's other people, I promise you, then there's some others that go, I don't really, I, 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 well, I won't get into that. I won't say that. There's some other people that, that have said, like, uh, he's going to split hell wide open. And I'm like, really? You don't know me. You should know me. But it doesn't, you, you know, she loves me, but I can tell you there's some people she, I'm not going to say she hates them because I don't think she hates anybody, but there are some people where she, she don't have much for. She don't, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know if I help them or not. Because we're human and we have those same thoughts just like you, right? But God don't see it that way. He looks and he goes, I even love Jason Banks. I even love Joe Sullivan. 
I love everybody, every person here, and I want them all. I want them all. I want to see them all come into the kingdom. That's why he wrote all this stuff down. Last one, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, he says, And so it is written, the man, the first man, Adam, became a living being, meaning I created him as a living being. But the last Adam, or the second Adam, who's that referencing? Jesus, Jesus became a life-giving spirit. And I would just say this, not to add to that scripture, but just to give clarification to it so you understand it. For everyone that will receive him, for every person that will receive Jesus, he became your life source. He became yours, your resource for everything you need. And he did it all out of love. I don't see that anywhere else. Amen. To me, it's like I look at that and I go, uh, that alone wins you the, my, my, my vote. That alone wins my acceptance, my yes and amen. That alone because I know he loves me and he proved it. And watch, let me say this last thing. I was talking about Josephus. Give me that book real quick. So I was talking about Josephus. Okay, here's a history book, right? Josephus talking about all these things. This is a proven history book, okay? There are things that have been accounted because the way that you prove history books is because you look at different accounts, not just one, because I could write anything and say something happened and it didn't and just somebody preserve it in 500 years from now go, oh, right there it is. It's written down. It happened. That doesn't mean it happened. It's, it's not only documented here, but they're cross-referenced. Other books, other history books. Jesus truly was a person. That's history. That's a history. That's a, there's no disputing it. Can't dispute that. But what you have to know is what was the motivation behind what he did. Can, can you give your life willingly? Can you give your life willingly for somebody? Maybe, maybe, maybe your kids. Maybe somebody in your family. Maybe. These many couldn't even do that. They love them, but they're like, ah, I got to hold on to life. But could you give it for people that hate you and spit on you? and are willing to kill you, can you go, uh, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Can you do that? And the answer is unequivocally, no. I can't. Somebody that would harm your family, could you give your life for them? No, you want to harm them. So it's not in you with the capability of doing that, but yet it is in the capability of God and able, being able to say, I'll do it for you and I'll take the first step. I don't see that in any other religion. Let me have that communion. We're getting ready to receive communion and then we'll dismiss you after this. But this is the reason that we do this. The reason that we, if you've not been served communion and you want to receive it as we get ready to do it, would you please raise your hand, keep your hand held until everybody, until one of the ushers can get to you. This is the reason that we do this. This reminds me, it reminds me of something. Let me just say this as you're as they're serving. I was reminded of a story my daughter reminded me earlier. Years ago, the Spirit of God spoke to me when we were first starting the church. And the Lord spoke to me, and it was one of those moments I just knew it. And here's how you judge when the Lord speaks to you. Watch this. This is good. This is cool. The Lord spoke to me, and He said, I'm going to bring you people that nobody else wants. Now, I don't, there's, I'm not saying every church, but I took that to mean that some churches would not want. Because sometimes people live rough lives, right? 
Sometimes people, for whatever reason, the way they dress, uh, how they act, the type of personality they have, whatever thing, sometimes it's like, yeah, I don't want you in my club. I don't want you in my club. I got my club. This is our club here, and we don't want you in our club. But the Lord said to me, he said, I'm going to send you people that, you, that other people don't want. And he goes, and I want you to care for them just like what you would care for anybody else, whether they have lots of money or no money, whether they're dressed well or they're not dressed well, it doesn't matter, it's inconsequential. They are my people, and I want them cared for. And I was thinking about that when we read the, the, the part in Luke chapter 19 when uh, Zacchaeus said, uh, when Jesus told Zacchaeus, come down from there, I'm going to go to your house. Nobody else wanted Zacchaeus. They did not want him. They didn't, they, he wasn't good enough. They don't want him in their club. But Jesus said, watch, I want you in my club. I want you in my club. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care what, what level of, of, you know, life that you've lived up to that point. I don't care. I want you. I want you. And that's what the message was. And so when I heard that, it reminded me all throughout the scriptures, there are people that seemingly were not wanted by anybody else. But yet Jesus said, I want you. Whatever you've been through this morning, with every head bowed just quickly before we receive communion, whatever you've been through, 